We are going to pick up now talking about Leibniz. We've discussed this guy, Descartes. Leibniz is the fellow with the, the best hair on the slide. Um, here's a statue that stands of him. Um, as the group that did the biography on him, I think, did a pretty good job of emphasizing by, that Leibniz is not just like good at one thing. <laughs> he is unequivocally and unquestionably an enormous genius. And probably the reason why we are studying his philosophy today is because without a doubt he was a genius. And what we are struggling to do is make sense of it. If someone like me were to write the exact same things he <coughs> wrote and like, you know, he never existed, nobody would care. Because they would look at that and say, this, there's no way this works. Like, this, this is crazy. If Leibniz writes it, though, then we were like, there's got to be something more to this, and we just don't get it. That's the kind of person he is. He's just an, he, it's just hard to fathom the extent of his genius. To invent calculus on your own says quite a bit. Um, and he was a man of great accomplishments outside of mathematics as well. So... Um, truly an independent and original thinker, somebody that is just uh, creative and intelligent in so many ways. Um, the first thing we're going to be looking at is his book, Primary Truth. Well, it's not even really a book, right? It's like a really short paper, which is <coughs> nice. The nice thing that, so you'll notice the dates of this piece and the next piece, and the third piece we're reading, they're all spaced out by roughly ten years. Um, we're getting... <coughs> may I should say this. We don't have a systematic work that Leibniz wrote. Leibniz never sat down and wrote down, like, here is my, my beginning-to-end philosophy, starting from the very beginning and explaining from all the little pieces to how it all comes together as a whole. The closest thing we have to that, as the group emphasized, is something like the monadology, what you're going to be reading next for class after spring break. So what we have instead are a bunch of little fragments of things he's written. And each of these fragments kind of focuses on one aspect or another. They're written in different times. So we don't ever get the big picture from life. So what we're trying to do is piece together a big picture philosophy out of these little bits um, we're going to get a nice start on it this week, and then next week we are going to see at least maybe the most full and developed picture that we have in one piece. Um, but studying these first readings is kind of a nice way to ease into it and try to understand it. Some of the themes that we're going to get from him is uh, the struggle to understand freedom, determinism, and problems of causation, very similar to where we ended in our last class, uh, the last session. He is an anti-Cartesian in the sense that he doesn't think that you, sh the, the essence of matter is extension. Um, he is a rationalist like Descartes, um, and in fact he thinks that we are, the ability to reason is the way to solve a whole host of problems. And as the, I keep referring to this, but as the other, the, the group that just presented emphasized, he also was really into trying to resolve conflicts between religious factions. He tried to resolve problems between the Protestants and the Catholics. He tried to resolve problems between the Lutherans and the Calvinists. Um, he thought that if we could just get everyone to sit down and think logically, we wouldn't have uh, conflicts and problems. Um... Where we're going to be moving to is this idea of monads. He calls them different things in the readings that we have this week. Uh, true unities, atoms of substance. Um, what, he fought, what, he, what he's looking at are these things that he thinks are unique, fundamental substances that compose everything, and they are, by their essence, immaterial. And then finally... Another big theme of his philosophy is the idea of pre-established harmony. 
that there is no real causal interaction between anything. But it's just by God's perfect planning that everything fits together and in a way where it would be just like it would if they did causally interact. We're going to see more about what all this means. So he starts off his piece on primary truths with the idea of telling you what a primary truth is. He says a primary truth is an identity. When you say A is A, or everything is as it is, or nothing is greater or less than itself. Now, these are all things that are just like saying, that are just I statements of identity. And he, he gives them these other negative examples too, if you look at that. Like, it, it is false that A is not A, or A is not not A, things like that. But they're essentially all equivalent. Um, Let's take a look on page 265, and let's look at what he, where he's going to go with this. The second paragraph um, on the page, so, on the, so this is on the left-hand side, and let's talk about what he's trying to say about the nature of truth. So he's going to put forward a, a way to think about how to define truth. All right. So he says, all remaining truths are reduced to primary truths with the help of definitions. That is, through the resolution of notions. In this consists a priori proof. Proof independent of experience. Sorry. You know what? I think the paragraph I want to read is on the right-hand side, now that I'm looking at this. Look on the right-hand side, starting with therefore. Therefore. The predicate or consequent is always in the subject or the antecedent. And the nature of truth in general or the connection between the terms of a statement consists in this very thing. The, as Aristotle also observed, the connection and inclusion of the predicate in the subject is explicit in identities, but in all other propositions it is implicit and must be shown through the analysis of notions. A priori demonstrations rest on this. So what he's saying is truth is this, um, that all truths, maybe I was reading the right thing, so this does take us to what I read in the first place. All truths are either primary truths or reducible is the word he uses. Maybe what he means is derivable, I'm not exactly sure how to take that, from primary truths with the help of definitions. So. One way to think about what he's saying here is that everything is either so everything is either an, a truth that states identity, or with the help of some basic definitions, you can derive any other truth from primary truths. The other thing, which is the second thing I jumped to, was this: that he's giving us what is sometimes called a concept containment theory of truth. A proposition is true if and only if the predicate is contained within the subject. You might say, what does that even mean? I, here are maybe some attempts to give you some examples. So think about the statement, a bachelor is an unmarried man. Hopefully you all know that that is a true statement. What makes that true? Leibniz says what makes it true is, via, is that the idea of a bachelor contains within it the idea of being an unmarried man. Here's another way to get it. A dog is an animal. Why is that true? Because the idea of a dog contains within it, among other features, that it is an animal. And green is a color, the same thing. The, the idea of green includes within, the, within itself the idea that it is a color. So if if a, if a predicate is contained within a subject, that is what makes it true. That is how we know things are true, is when one thing, in, when the, the, the predicate is contained within the subject matter. So there are going to be things that we can figure out like this that are just matters of identity. And these are what, the ones down here, I think you would say, come out from considerations of identity. The harder question is, how do, you do, how do we do this with things that are not identities? I think that he thinks as we learn more about things, we can do more of this. Um, 
We'll just have to see how this plays out a little bit in his philosophy. Um, are there questions about what he means by a primary truth or what he <coughs> means, or what we're talking about with the concept containment theory of truth? The second thing is maybe not, I didn't, maybe didn't explain it perfectly clear, I don't know. So, he gives us one of his famous principles on 266. Um, here, he doesn't call it the principle of sufficient reason, but you should think in your head, like maybe a little note here, because he's going to talk about this principle in the other writings. Um, so let's take a look at this first paragraph on 266. So after talking about primary truths, concept theory of containment, the concept containment theory of truth, he then says, many things of great importance follow from these considerations. Considerations insufficiently attended to because of their obviousness. For the received axiom that nothing is without reason or there is no effect without a cause, directly follows from these considerations. So those italicized phrases, there, nothing is without reason, there is no effect without a cause, those are thought of, the, these might be ways to state the principle of sufficient reason. We're going to see other versions later. It says that though that principle follows directly from what we just read on the other page. Um, so he goes on and tries to sketch out a brief argument for how you can derive this principle of sufficient reason from um, primary truths and the concept containment of truth. So the principle of sufficient reason, as we said, nothing is without reason or there is no effect without a cause. And here is the sort of short proof he gives of this. And what I have up here is just sort of the, no, the basic idea. If there was a truth that had no reason for it being true, then it would violate his concept containment theory of truth. There would be no subject that didn't have the predicate contained within it. So here's how this works. All truths consist of propositions whose predicate is contained within its subject. To allow that something has no cause or reason implies that there is a truth whose subject does not contain its predicate. After all, nothing cannot be part of a subject. Therefore, everything must have a sufficient cause or reason for its being true. Um, this is another kind of interesting thing to look at. I don't want to dwell too much on this particular argument today, but if you find this compelling or interesting, or if you're puzzled by it, there's a lot of things you could look at for your paper in this class that would just look into what, how this argument goes. If how Leibniz is trying to establish that there is a principle of sufficient reason. Um, another important principle he gives us is in the next paragraph, the principles of identity. Um, I'm not going to read the paragraph, but the way that this plays out is, this, is in this quote here, that there cannot be two things that differ in number alone. And this follows from the principle of sufficient reason, he thinks that there always has to be some sufficient reason why they are different and that the explanation and that explanation must derive from some difference they contain. Otherwise, if you just had two things that were exactly alike, but you just said, well, this is one thing and this is another thing, that wouldn't explain why they're different. That wouldn't explain the differences that they have. There's got to be some deeper explanation. So he goes on to say in this very same paragraph that there are no two things that are exactly alike, like no two blades of grass, no two leaves, um, no two things are ever exactly alike. Everything is unique. If, if everything was not unique, then there, it would violate the principle of sufficient reason, which he said follows necessarily from his concept containment of truth. So you'll, once again, he's maybe one way to think about Leibniz as we understand him better. When he starts saying some really crazy things, maybe it's because they he believes they necessarily follow from more evident truths that he established earlier. 
But philosophers really worry a lot about whether these principles of identities are true. I mean, couldn't two nails that are like mass produced by a machine be identical in all respects? I mean, where they're exactly the same. They're made of the exact same material, they're the exact same weight, the exact same size, the exact same, um, you know, everything is exactly the same about them, except, you know, one is here and one is there. Couldn't that be the case? And if you've had metaphysics, you know that we argue about this for a few weeks um, because this leads to some bigger things. The reading we had in there brought up this question. Could there be a universe that is where all that exists in the universe are two iron spheres and that's it? If, that, if you could create a universe like that, couldn't, wouldn't that mean Leibniz was wrong? And this has deeper, actually, problems depending on other things you might be committed to in philosophy. If you think everything you know about, if you think all there is to reality is what you can perceive about it, then you have to re you have to be like Leibniz, because then it would be impossible if everything that you can know about reality just can just comes from what you can see, what you can feel, what you can touch, what you can observe about it. Then you have to be committed to the idea if two things are different things, then there's got to be an observable difference in those two things. So very quickly, some of these things that uh, Leibniz has committed that seem kind of weird actually are things that have some really interesting ramifications depending on what you think about the world. Leibniz is committed to this because of the principle of sufficient reason. Other people are committed to this principle because they believe everything that is real about the world, everything that, that exists, must be observable. You can, of course, you can be done with Leibniz's principle if you just think, there's more to reality than what is observable, and also if you think, you know, principle of sufficient reason doesn't apply here, or principle of sufficient reason is false. Here's another real interesting thing that he says here on 266. Look on the right column, and look at the second, par second full paragraph there. He says, the complete or perfect notion of a substance uh, or of an individual substance, contains all of its predicates, past, present, and future. For it is certainly true that a future predicate will be, and so it is contained in the notion of a thing. And thus everything that will happen to Peter or Judas, both necessary and free, is contained in the perfect individual notion of Peter or Judas, considered in the realm of possibility by withdrawing the mind from the divine decree for creating him, and is seen there by God. And from this it is obvious that God chose from an infinite number of possible individuals those he thought most in accord with the supreme and hidden ends of his wisdom. All right, maybe I should stop here. Free will stuff does follow pretty quickly from this. What is he saying? So let, let's just start first. What did he say is in the perfect notion of an individual substance? What did he say? Yeah. Past, present, and future. Everything about its past, present, and future. So, let me start with a simple kind of thing. We could talk about, here's a, here's a substance, my pen. We could talk about, what is my, my pen presently contains within it, right now, everything that is true about it, like, you know, that it's blue, it, well, it has blue ink, you know, what it's made out of, that it's starting to fade across here. Um, but the, that, that, that's not a perfect conception of this pen. That is just a fragmentary conception of this pen. The perfect conception of this pen wouldn't just tell me about what it's like now. It would also include what it was like in its complete past. How was it yesterday? How was it the day before? And so on. And it will also tell me about its complete future. What will happen to it? You know, will I start chewing on it? Will, um, you know, when will it run out of ink? Will it get lost? All those exciting questions in the life of a pen. Now, it's one thing to do that with pens, but this would, he's talking about Peter and Judas. Um, famously, what, what, is, what is Judas famous for? Betraying Jesus. Betraying Christ, and um, by... Most accounts, you know, committing suicide and 
spending eternity in hell. And Peter, did he deny Christ? No. Yes. Yeah. Yes. What happened to him? How, why, why did Peter not go hang himself and die? Was he martyred? He did. Uh, he, he most likely was martyred, yeah. So, what was the difference in the two? Mostly Peter asked for forgiveness from God, exactly. That's right. Peter wanted forgiveness and received it. Now, here's what Leibniz is saying. The co perfect no and complete notion of Judas contains within Judas's nature all of Judas's past, all of his present, all of his future. That God, when he created Judas, created him that way. And when God created Peter, he created him also with his complete past, present, and future in him. And when God created you, God created you with all with, as a complete notion, completed with everything about you. Um, so... The perfect or complete notion of a substance is that which contains all of its predicates, past, present, and future. And a substance, therefore, must contain all of its predicates, otherwise it would be a different substance. This is, what, I mean, in part, what differentiates Peter from Judas. They contain within themselves different things. So... One of the things I stopped with here is that God, when he decrees to create the world, decides to create the world um, from an infinite number of possible individuals, those he thought most in accord with the supreme and hidden ends of his wisdom. This is setting up the idea that when Leibniz believes when God created the world, that he created it where each, with each substance kind of working in harmony with one another. A kind of harmony that he believes makes this world, not we're going to get to this later, not just a good world, but the best conceivable of all possible worlds you can imagine. Now, the thing that bothers us for the moment is that this seems to conflict with free will. If God created Judas such that he has to betray Christ and go hang himself afterwards, how can Judas be free? that's contained in his nature and his essence, if that's part of who he is as an individual, how can he do otherwise? Um, we're not going to answer that one today. We're going to get to, this keeps coming up in, our, in, in Leibniz. This is something that is a recurring theme. In this first reading, I just want to touch on a few things. The next thing that is of interest to us is what he says on 267 about these individual substances. That in all individual created substances are different expressions of the same universe. Like I said, this stuff would be insane if it weren't for this guy being a known genius. What is he saying here? He wants to say that every substance bears is like a representation of the entire universe from its perspective. Now, it's not a complete and perfect representation or expression of the universe, but that each little substance that exists out there, each little thing, is in its own way a, a complete reflection and expression of the entire universe. Which also means if you were to change one thing in the universe, you would have to change everything in the universe. Because changing one thing means that everything else that is a reflection or expression of that one little bit would have to be changed. So if I wanted to wear, instead of a, a brown jacket, if I wanted to wear a black jacket today, it's not as simple as just saying, well, I can just trade out the jackets and everything else is the same. We'd have to change everything because everything in the universe in some kind of way reflects this reality. I know, this is weird. Um, 
Here's another thing he wants to say here, that no created substance exerts a metaphysical action or influx on any other thing. He's saying there's no causal interaction between anything. So with Descartes, maybe we have the problem of how do minds interact with bodies, but we're fine with bodies interacting with bodies and minds interacting with minds. But wait. Leibniz is going to tell us that no two things can actually interact with each other in, at all. What he puts forward is the idea that what he calls mind-body concomitance, which is or concomitance, which is the idea that mind and body are two things that are perfectly synchronized with one another. That God, so he. He agrees with the with Elizabeth's critique of Descartes. If you, once you conceive mind and body as separate things, how do they interact? You, they can't. But he doesn't like what the occasionalists did either, where they say, well, here's how you make it work. God steps in every single time and performs a miracle. That same, he calls that a deus ex machina. It's like a nice way of saying like God, God has to cheat every time to make the universe work. Instead, De, Leibniz said, you know what I was, I came to realize that the way to fix this problem is to say mind and body don't really interact, but God set things up such that when things happen in your mind, they are timed just right with things that happen in your body and vice versa. So that when you say, all right, arm, go up, and your arm goes up, it's not that your mind actually causally interacted with your body in making your arm rise. It was that your mind, it, your mind was perfectly timed with your body. So that after you say arm, go up, it happens, but that was like a pre-timed event. And vice versa, if I stub my toe on the desk and I feel pain in my mind, it's not that the, the sensation that something happened within the body that caused my mind to do that, it's that the event was perfectly timed with the event in my mind. And he thinks that this is the way it should work because if God it really wants to create a perfect universe, he would create a universe that has this kind of pre-established harmony to it. Maybe, maybe you already said it, but the, if they're just timed like properly, then what actually means you only go up? He believes we're going to say more about this, but the, ev the only thing that really can cause things to happen comes from within. Everything is sort of self-driven. Okay. There's more to this. Don't worry. Um, just to make this more fun, he also doesn't believe in, in what he, he calls in this reading atoms, and in the next reading, um, material atoms, and that's what he means here. He doesn't, this is a nice way of saying, he doesn't believe, at least in a very real, strong notion of matter. Roughly, here's the argument. And remember, he invented calculus, which allows you to perform functions that go into infinity. For any, extent, any amount of extension, this is the anti-Cartesian bit here, you can cut that, ex that thing in half. And for that thing, you can cut it in half, and that thing you can cut in half. How many times can you cut an extended thing in half? An infinite number of times. There's no limit. Well, he says, people who believed in atoms, and this was sort of a big movement in this time, um, they believe there's some smallest physical particle in the universe. They just call that an atom. Um, and that's what everything else is made up out of. And he says in the other piece that he was once attracted to this view, but then he realized this, that for as small as that is, you could always, in principle, imagine taking an atom and cutting it in half. And now it would have parts. So I guess an atom isn't the most fundamental basic thing. And those two parts that we can't, we can cut those in half cut those in half. He came to the conclusion that whatever is most fundamental about reality cannot be matter, cannot be extended. Because if it was, then we could always cut it in half and take out those parts from it. Whatever is most fundamental has no parts. It's the thing that you put together to create stuff that has parts. So everything can be subdivided. So since every material thing can be subdivided, the most fundamental thing there is to reality must not be a material thing. So instead of atoms, he takes us to 
these other things. And look on the very last page of this reading, 268, right-hand column. This is how he describes them, the very top. Something lacking extension is required for the substance of bodies. Otherwise, there would be no source for the reality of phenomena or for true unity. There is always a plurality of bodies and never one. And therefore, in reality, there is not even a plurality. Cordemoy, remember that guy who was an occasionalist, um, he proved atoms using a similar argument. But since atoms are excluded, what remains is something lacking extension, analogous to the soul, which they once called form or species. These true unities, these real basic fundamental elements of reality are not extended things. And in here, he calls them even souls. And in the next reading, the same. I mean, one way to put this is, what is reality made up out of? Souls. He thinks everything is composed, the, the most basic unit is a soul. Now, what does that mean? We still have to figure that out. But that's the idea that's going to continue to be developed in the next couple of readings. Is there anything in primary truths that you'd like to revisit before I just keep pressing along here? Yeah, I, was, I had a question about the identity thing, which you know two things to be separate. Yeah. All right, well, I just a uh, hypothetical, so actually a real question. Um, let's say I had two computers, right? And they both had the same exact program. Can't you say those programs are the same? He does talk about in uh, other writings that in abstraction, some things can be similar, like perfectly similar. <coughs> so that you can imagine a, cir a circle being just like another circle. The question would then become, what do you think a, what do you think a program is? Is a program a thing or not? All right. If a program is a thing, then he would say there's got to be some difference, some infinitesimal difference between the two that maybe we can't even know. But there's got to be a difference. Okay. If, it, if a program is just a formal abstract entity, he might be okay with them being identical because they're not things. Okay. <laughs> so that's a, isn't that a grand way to answer your question? <laughs> Other ideas with this? Leibniz, like I, I don't know how to say this enough. Leibniz, the only reason why we take this seriously is because Leibniz was an unequivocal genius. You're saying if two things are manufactured, I'd say like the exact same point in time, and they're exactly identical in every shape, weight, size, whatever, all that stuff, they're different because they're in two different places? He would say there's more than that to it, even. And there's got to be some other difference between the two. Even if, and he says this in other writings, that maybe we don't see the difference, but there's got to be one. <laughs> even with like molecules can be structured with anything like that. Molecules like organic chemistry, yeah. if you learn about all protons and electrons. Yeah, so Everything's different, but it might be the same, you know, like a resin structure, which is like the same thing, but the electrons are moved in right. different ways, but they chemically balance each other out, I guess. Yeah, I mean, if I mean so it's different. But the atomic world, it gets harder and easier. It gets easier with big objects, because, strictly speaking, do you think the exact same number of electrons are in this table as in that one? The same thing goes, I mean, like, you'll, even on mass produ produced lines, <coughs> we're going to probably have difference of, like, of those elements, I mean, of those, those parts at the atomic level. But this is where it gets harder. He's going to say every electron is different from one another. And every proton and every neutron and every quark, I mean, that's where, I mean, scientists are sort of are puzzled because, I mean, as far as we can tell, they're all the same. Could you be wrong? Could Leibniz be wrong? Yeah. He might be. Modern science, I think, hopes so. <laughs> But if he's right, I mean, this whole argument about you, you could always divide things in half, if there is something to that, then we have to read, I mean, he's going to say, he's not going to say that science is wrong, as much as he's going to say we just have to rethink what we, the way we think about the world. Let's move on and see a little bit more. I'm going to get through as much as I can of this, maybe in about 10 minutes here. Um, so this is 1695. We move close to a decade or so after the last reading. Um, this one, so the first reading, I don't think that he published in his lifetime. I think these are just some of his writings he had. That, so this one, was a, he was asked 
to publish this because people are finding out about his philosophy and they're trying to make sense of it. And they say, can you tell us about your view? So in this one, he calls these things that we've been trying to get at true unities now. That's how we'd like to re refer to them. Um, building on the last argument that we went over, he says these things are not material things because you cannot divide them. They're supposed to be the most basic building blocks of reality. So they have no parts and they can't be broken up. Since all material things with extension, you can always in principle cut in half, it must be the case then that these true unities are not material atoms. He calls them souls. He refers to them as primitive forces that are a source of activity. In other words, he thinks of them as intrinsically being moved, uh, intrinsically as containing within themselves motion, as opposed to being acted upon, like being passive. So these are things that are truly active entities. They're not passive entities. Um, so everything in reality is a soul, or is composed of souls or minds. The desk, the chair, the book, your glasses, your pen, a bunch of souls. But, look on the bottom right of 270. Um, he says, I judge, however, that we must not indiscriminately confuse minds or rational souls with other forms or souls, for they are of a higher order and have incomparably greater perfection than the forms thrust into matter, which, in my view, are found everywhere. Minds being like little gods in comparison with them, made in the image of God, and having in them some ray of the light of divinity. So he's saying, don't, just because I'm calling these things souls, don't think that everything has a soul like you and I have a soul. There's a difference between the souls that make up material objects and things and the rational minds that are found in people like you and I. More on that as we continue to understand what the heck he's doing. Um, let me skip reading the passage here and let's jump to the punchline. So, um, he wants us, we know that he wants to reject the existence of material atoms. This is partly because of the issue of subdividing. But there's another reason that is at stake here, which is that he doesn't see how we could transfer one thing from one substance to another. If these true unities or these, subs these atoms of substance are really basic, like the simplest kinds of things you can get, then you can't pass something from one into the other. So you can't transfer energy or motion or force from one to another. Because that would mean like this one had force and it, as a part of it, and it transferred it and gave it to this other one. Well, if you can give and receive something like that, then you're not basic. So he wants to say that these atoms of substance or these metaphysical points, these true unities, um, they don't interact with one another. They can't exchange things with one another. They don't, um, they're not composed of anything. Um, let me see what else I want to bring out from this. These metaphysical points, or these atoms of substance, he said, are the real things of the universe. And so this leads you, well then what is everything, what is the book? What is the desk? What is my glasses? What are, you know, what, is, what are these things? Um, Once again, I'm going to not go read this, but just say this is what he thinks of these, these true unities, these souls. Every single one of them, if you remember from the last reading, contains its past, present, and future all within itself. What happens is over time, all that happens is the thing just does, it just, what he describes as unfolding, that it already contains within itself its future. So what's happening is that it's just doing what it's supposed to do. It's just happening. The, it's making itself do what it's supposed to do. It's driving itself to its own end. And everything is like this. And so 
one of the questions that came up earlier was like, well, how, do, how does causation happen, or how do things happen in the world? They all happen as a result of dr these internal forces driving them to do their own thing. Um, he also says that our internal sensations are true appearances and like well-ordered dreams. This is where he, we come back to the question, what do you say about tables and chairs and books and everything, all the other material stuff in the world? He says that the representational content we receive about the world is not caused by external things, but it is generated from the internal constitution of the being that has it, you and I. So part of your internal essence, your complete notion, is that you would have the experiences you're having now. But you're not caused to have these experiences by me or by anything else in the world. It's just part of your internal nature. And as that unfolds, you have these experiences. And everything is like that. If you're in a conversation with somebody, according to Leibniz, you don't actually interact with one another. What's happening is a perfectly timed event where they say something, and then from their own nature, within their own essence, comes the reply that you say. And here's the catch, is that you actually hear, you, what you hear from them is part of your own internal nature, and then when you speak, they're not hearing your voice, they're hearing what they were pre-programmed to have unfold and happen. So everybody, you kind of say people interpret things subconsciously the way they understand it. In a way, everything, I mean, everybody just has their own, is sort of in their own isolated experience. Nobody has shared experience. Yeah. So it's like we're computers. Or like machines. He would want to say, he wouldn't like that, but uh, he would want to say that it's, 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 there's something beautiful about this. Like in the Olympics, when those ice dancers did their little twizzles, you know, and they're like in perfect synchronization with one another, they weren't, what we like is how that synchronization was like beautiful and harmonious. They're not actually interacting with one another, it's just a perfectly timed spin that makes, that makes that look beautiful. Well, Leibniz thinks the whole universe is kind of like that. Where nothing actually is causing anything else to happen, it's just timed just right so that uh, it appears to be that way. <coughs> All right, I'm going to have to stop here. We've got a little bit more of the new system of nature to do, but I think we're going to be able to get caught up and on time for next week. One other thing. On Moodle, I have a series of questions I want you to answer for the first half of the monadology. I've got ten questions listed, and I tell you to pick your favorite seven to answer. Bring those with you when we have class. Either way. Okay.